Hello and welcome to DevConf 2022. My name is Moise Shebi and I'm the moderator of, uh, for this session. Next up, we have Timothy Apnell speaking about what's new and ahead in the Ansible community. Timothy Apnell is a senior product manager in the Ansible team at Red Hat. Now I'm going to give the floor to Timothy. Thanks, Moaz. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, glad to have you here to talk about uh, what we've been doing with Ansible, particularly in the community area. Uh, I'm going to do a quick overview of the different projects that we have going on that, that have happened in the last, uh, particularly in the last year or two, and some of the things that we're, that we're working on in the community level uh, going forward from there. Uh, you know, one thing I, I want to impress upon everyone is that Ansible isn't just the command line tool that it's known for and that the project the, began as. It's it's grown to be a lot more. There's a lot more in the the ecosystem that's available to the community um, and and as opportunities to contribute and get involved in the project. So I hope I can show you those things and get you interested in being a contributor uh, uh, or or even just beginning to use all, all this work that, that the community has been doing. So with that, uh, moving right along, uh, oops, sorry. Okay. Uh, what I always like to begin with when I talk about Ansible are the principles that Ansible was based on from the very beginning, just as a reminder and to set some context to uh, you know, what we're talking about, why things happen the way that they do. And those those principles that, that have been there from the very beginning, I, I was a contributor to version 0 0.5, I think it was, uh, you know, and have been using it ever since then. And, and these have remained the same, is that Ansible is about being simple, but allowing you to do powerful things in a simple way and remaining agentless so that you don't have to have all that pre set up and things of that nature that you have to manage. So it adds to the simplicity of how it works. So one of the things that's happened, though, over the many years that Ansible has been around is that it's seen tremendous amount of growth, growth in terms of its user base, uh, some of its code base, but also in the use cases of how people are, are using Ansible and what they are automating with it. And with that growth has come, uh, you know, modules, I think when I first started getting involved with Ansible, like I said, it was like 0 0.5. I, I think there's only like 50 or 60 modules. It was less than 100. Uh, at one point, uh, we reached almost 4,000. Uh, it was growing at a, at a huge pace because of all the different things that people were using Ansible for in all the different ways and all the different use cases. So that was causing um, some side effects. That type of growth and that type of success caused uh, us to have to look at how Ansible was being uh, um, managed, architected, distributed, the whole thing. So things worked great in the beginning, but at, with that growth, it started to break down. It started to cause problems. There were side effects to that growth. And the ways that we saw it, and I'll just touch on this a little bit, because uh, this is a community event, but you know, we were getting in, in, from the customers, the people that were using Ansible uh, through Red Hat, we're, we're getting very confused to, uh, you know, what 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 to do about when they had issues. Uh, you know, they they wanted the stability of longer life cycles uh, because of the nature and scope of the work they were doing. But at the same time, they needed the latest features and enhancements that they needed that quickly. On on the developer side and, and more on the community side, we we had like in, in the Ansible. Uh, project itself, we reached over 4,300 open issues. We had uh, pull requests or at 2,000. You know, and an interesting thing that went on then is we were measuring how quickly our team were, were closing those things, and they were closing them uh, as fast as they ever had been before. But those, the amount of issues and the amount of PRs that were rolling in were rolling in even faster than the ones that they could go through and, 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 and process. So that 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 was becoming an issue. The other the other thing that we were seeing is that with all these different use cases, people using for networking, for security, for Windows, for Linux, for cloud, uh, one size didn't fit all. Uh, the you know the the the, the single batteries included distribution uh, just was having trouble meeting the needs of all these different use cases. 
Uh, and then another thing we're seeing, and, and this goes to the open issues and PR thing, but even the work that our team was doing um, to enhance the the, uh, the application to the project was that some things went in quickly and other things didn't. So there was a lot, there was a fair bit of frustration to uh, uh, what was getting done, when it was getting done, in certain parts of the community and the user base. So these were all things that we looked at and said, okay, we need to make some changes here. We need to adapt to this growth and the success and the evolution of Ansible. So that what that led us to is to say, all right, in order to do this, Ansible has always been known for shipping a batteries included distro. You installed Ansible, you got everything. You got the modules, the plugins. There was no package manager. You just installed it, you had it, you were ready to go. But we that had now become a liability. So the first thing, the first step, we had to do was separate the Ansible content from the core engine, the runtime itself. So in version 2.9, that was the last one where we had that uh, all-inclusive batteries included type of distro. Uh, and then we separated out the content from the core engine itself. So this is a very important thing that had a, had a, a, a lot of, of effects that rolled out of that, that, that came out of that uh, decision, that change to do that thing. And, and you're going to see this in the next slides and also in how we version uh, different things. And so I'll get through all of this. So in order, when we, in separating the content, we needed a way to bundle up uh, and provide the content that was now living separately from the core engine itself. And in doing that, we came up with what is called Ansible content collections. And these are uh, a, a new standard way of distributing, maintaining, and consuming uh, Ansible automation. So they're standardized way that you can organize and package things like roles, modules, utility libraries, plugins, and documentation into one uh, portable bundle that you can um, um, distribute separately from the Ansible engine itself. Uh, these Each of these uh, collections are independently versioned. They can work on their own timeline uh, within their own sub-communities within the Ansible community. Uh, it just gave a lot more flexibility and freedom in order to ship this new innovation uh, when it was ready instead of tying it down to the engine itself. So uh, what happens now today when we uh, create a, a distribution, I'll explain these version numbers here on the screen in a bit. Um, I, I know this is a, a, a source of some confusion for people that haven't been uh, watching the Ansible community closely for the last couple months. Um, but we have, uh, when we now do a community package build, we take a, uh, we, we, we pull in all the different content collections that have been, uh, that are, are, are being included uh, and take the uh, latest stable version of the Ansible core engine and they're, they're bundled all up into one package and then put out into PyPy for your use to do a pip install Ansible. Uh, so, you know, just to review what was happening before, uh, before we had collections in older versions of Ansible, like for example here, two, uh, Ansible 2.5, is that we would release 2.5 and then four to six months would pass, in which case, uh, there would be bug improvements to modules. Uh, new people, you know, we would, you know, people in the community would introduce new uh, new modules, new functionality enhancements to those modules. They would get merged in, but you couldn't use them until we would get around to version 2.6. After that, four to six months would go by. So during that time, you know, as as an end user, you did not have access to that functionality. So what happened then after collections is we would we can ship a distribution, uh, but then bug improvements for modules would be introduced. But then using the 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 uh, collections mechanism, end users could install new versions of the collections, uh, updated versions of the collections, collections with with bug fixes, with new enhancements as soon as they were available. That by the time then 5.0 rolled around, the, the, let's say the next release of the Ansible package. Uh, they were already making use of these enhancements that were done on the content level um, uh, before they um, we, we, we shipped the next uh, major release. So this is what we saw as an advantage and, and, and the best 
uh, uh, compromise, if you will, uh, to to dealing with this growth issue of both use cases and and just the user base and the needs of of end users. So talked a little bit about the community package um, in explaining the the you know this this big change that happened in in the Ansible space about two years ago, um, roughly. Uh, we were working on it for longer than that, but that's when you know, things started to be be released for use. Uh, what, we, what came out of this was the Ansible community package. And what this is, is, is an open source batteries included distribution of Ansible, similar to the one that existed before collections were introduced. So it tries to simulate that same, you know, um, you just do a pip install Ansible and you get a ton of content that you're ready to go with um, and, 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 and use just like you did before. Uh, despite all the changes that we made and how it, how we, we developed Ansible. So inside of the, the each of uh, Ansible community package release is the latest Ansible core engine, uh, and then the modules and plugins, which are considered core, uh, that are, are, are so essential to using Ansible, you just can't use Ansible without those. So that's, that's part of the, the core collection. But then on top of that is we, we bundle thousands of uh, well, it's, it's actually hundreds of uh, community supported Ansible collections, which contain thousands of modules and plugins. And these are all selected uh, uh, based on the Ansible community inclusion uh, policy. There's a whole system and policy that I'll talk about a little bit later to how we pick the ones that go into the community package itself. Uh, and like I said, this is just to give uh, end users the ability to use uh, these uh, to have an, uh, a distribution that they can install uh, very easily like they did before, but it doesn't stop them from going out and getting other collections that we may not have included in the community package or creating their own for their own use and bringing them into using with the Ansible engine. Um, so one thing I want to point about the Ansible community package is that it has a, a different versioning scheme than the Ansible core engine. I know this this came up yesterday. We had a, a, an Ansible community uh, meetup, and this was one of the questions that was asked of us was that you know, there was confusion on, oh, I heard there's Ansible 210, 211, 212, but then I'm seeing you know, 4.0, 5.0, 5.2. Uh, that's because there are now, uh, in this case, two distinct different projects going on with their own independent versioning. So the core engine, the runtime of Ansible that, that things started off as, uh, they began that those continue to have releases like, like 2.11, 2.12 right now is the latest stable there. The community package is using a, a, a semantic versioning uh, system so that it, it, it leapt to a 3.00 uh, about six months later, it was a 4.00. Then another about six months later, there was a 5.00, and they've since done a 5.1, a 5.2, and I understand a 5.3 is due out shortly. So um, something to keep in mind, and, and, and hopefully that explains some of the version numbers you saw uh, in my earlier slides when I was talking about the, the separation of content inside of Ansible. Um, so moving right along, uh, one other thing to note is that the, the these releases, these community packages, goes into PyPy. They are picked up by other uh, uh, distribution um, repositories and 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 system, but PyPy is where uh, this goes first and is sort of the official place that it gets published to. If you have more questions about how this whole system works, it was a great blog post written. It's about 18 months ago that I've linked to here that covers uh, frequently asked questions and goes into a lot more detail um, to how how the, the Ansible community package comes together and works and some of the differences with the core, the core engine. Uh, one of the other things that, that we've added, and if you take uh, you know one of the one of the few things you take away from this is to sign up for the bullhorn. The bullhorn is a uh, currently, it's a biweekly newsletter that goes out with all the activity and um, uh, news about the community distribution and the Ansible community in general of all the different collections that are being 
uh, publish things like contributor conferences uh, or uh, and any type of, of activity. I, I really love reading the bullhorn when it hits my inbox. I always like looking at it because there's so much going on, even uh, myself as, as working inside of Red Hat as an Ansible product manager, have trouble keeping up with all the activity and the bullhorn does a really great job of, of, of summarizing all that and letting you know what you need to know. If you wanna look back there uh, at all the archives, I think they're on their 44th uh, release. Uh, there's, there's a link to the archive. You can look back on uh, you know, what, what's been coming up. I really, really encourage you to subscribe to the bullhorn. Uh, to keep up with the Ansible community. Okay, so that that covers the the main things that happened inside of the engine and with the Ansible distribution that everyone is used to being able to work with um, out there. We, we've begun introducing a lot of other projects around the AMP, Ansible ecosystem. And while this one isn't necessarily a project, it's something that it's getting a lot of attention that we've gone out and done uh, um, mostly in response to organizations that were using Ansible at huge scale uh, with a great deal of sophistication uh, and, and both scale and the number of, of, of nodes that they were managing, the number of people that were using it, the, the geographic disbursement of those people using Ansible automation. And it is something called uh, execution environments uh, that you might hear of uh, out there. Uh, it doesn't directly impact the community package or the core engine, but it, it, it is getting a lot of interest in the community. Uh, and what it does is, like I said, it addresses the, the Ansible, um, Ansible dependencies. This is really tied to our AWX project uh, where you had to have uh, virtual environments to run different automation, Ansible automation jobs. Um, and that wasn't very portable. It was, it was difficult to maintain. If you were running in a cluster, you had to keep those in sync. So this is what the execution environments were designed to address. And what they do is that they package up all the components needed for automation in a portable cloud native way. So it's bundling together all the collections that your automation will need, any type of additional binary RPMs, uh, um, PIP, dependencies, uh, but it also includes a minimal Ansible, um, I should say minimal Ansible core uh, release and puts it in one container that then can be moved around and utilized wherever it's needed. So <clears throat> this, this diagram here shows you, uh, uh, you know, what goes into an execution environment where it's, it's the collection, the libraries and the um, uh, Ansible core getting combined up and has it's based on a rel uh, UBI uh, image. So you have that, that um, you know, baseline, really solid uh, Linux um, services in there, in, in, in the container itself that forms the execution environment. Now out of that, with, with creating these execution environments, like I said, the, the execution environment itself is not a project, uh, a standalone project itself was more of a, uh, of, of a concept and that's being built into other Ansible tools. Uh, in creating these execution environments, we've had to uh, create uh, some new tooling. So we have here, <clears throat> I'm gonna go over these in a little more detail, Ansible Builder, which lets you create these execution environments very easily. Ansible Navigator, which lets you do um, um, development uh, and it's, it's, it's a dev tool that for working with these execution environments and testing and developing automation against them. Um, and then a whole host of other Ansible content tools that aid in, in the creation and the testing of your Ansible content. So Ansible Builder, uh, you know, briefly stated is, is like, a, like I was saying, is, is a tool for creating your execution environment. Um, it allows you to, we, we, we as Red Hat are creating some uh, that are ready to use, ready to go of different of different flavors. But in, if you have your own need, a very specific need that you want to do, uh, what this is, is is a Python application that will let you, uh, it will produce a build context and then you uh, create a YAML file saying what needs to go into the, um, the execution environment itself. And then you run 
the tool against it and it builds the container for you. It builds the execution environment in a way that other Ansible systems can then utilize it uh, in order to do portable uh, automation executions um, wherever it goes. Another tool, uh, Ans Ansible Navigator that, that I was mentioning is the, the idea here was to create a more cohesive, consistent, uh, top level developer experience for the content that was going to be run in an execution environment. So this is when you're creating a playbook um, that you can test it against the actual execution environment that it's gonna run on top of. Uh, this is really a, uh, a CLI uh, and it is based on a lot of CLI conventions of people that are used to Vim uh, will be right at home inside of Ansible Navigator. Uh, it's a uh, text-based user interface. Uh, so it's not a command line tool, but it's also not a GUI tool. So, uh, you know, it gives you, I believe it's based on end curses. Uh, it gives you different, different windows to show, um, you know, what's happening as you're running your uh, playbooks against the execution environments and the lookup documentation right, right in the window itself. And, and a whole lot of other, uh, you know, Vim-like commands that um, it recognizes and, and, and just just provides a better uh, developer experience, uh, in particular for working with these execution environments. So what this all looks like uh, is the general workflow is that you use Ansible uh, Builder to create an execution environment and then to develop your automation, you use Ansible Navigator, which then executes uh, against a playbook along with that execution environment. Uh, as I mentioned, there's also more Ansible content tools. Uh, I have Ansible Navigator here on the list because that is part of this family, but I, that one deserved a, a special call out. But other, other projects that we have that we're developing uh, um, out there in the community is an Ansible language server for, for um, you know, just enhancing the development development tools. Uh, Ansible Lint was something that was created in the community and adopted uh, by Red Hat for, for giving you best practice tips and pointing out things that might be uh, an issue within your, your playbook. Ansible Test, which is, came out of the core project for testing, doing, doing the type of unit testing against modules and plugins of that nature. Uh, Molecule is another project that came started off in the community and we brought in this is for doing like integration testing of of how will my module how will my roles uh, work together and doing that level of testing um, there and then uh, another th thing that's out there is if you're a vs code user there's now a vs code um, um, uh, plugin for doing your development inside of vs code and getting all the tool tips and and uh, um, you know uh, formatting coloring uh, right inside of VS Code of your Ansible content. We also have a lot of work going on in Ansible uh, Galaxy. Uh, right now, there's there's uh, we're working through some things. There's been the community version of Galaxy, which has been around for many, many years. Uh, they added collection support to that a couple of years ago, and it also handled standalone rules, roles, excuse me. We needed also uh, to create something else for uh, Galaxy, well, for what we were doing on the product level, uh, that code base we've now referred to as Galaxy NG. We couldn't, with the way the community um, version code was written was not going to allow us to do what we needed to there so that we had to create our own, a new code base, which was Galaxy NG. Uh, and that's the upstream to uh, a component in the Ansible platform called Automation Hub. The one thing that didn't happen during the NG development was the support of standalone roles. So it only supports collections right now, but there's plans to add support for standalone roles in this code base. And the reason that we're doing that is that we're looking to move to a unified code base, meaning that the, what's being used uh, on Galaxy um, sorry, Ans um, sorry, I have the URL wrong here. It should be galaxy.ansible.com. Um, that 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 is using the same code base as what we're using for the upstream of Automation Hub, and you know the reason that is not only just consistency, but also the ability. Right now, we're managing two code bases, and and you know this way uh, everything will get more timely updates and more attention and things like that. So. Um, so look for that to come or come join, join in on that work. 
A uh, couple other quick things. I know I'm running out of time here uh, happening out in the community. This is one that I work on uh, directly and often. It's the Ansible Operator SDK. If you're working in Kubernetes, there's this co concept of operators which run on your cluster itself to help you manage the life cycle of Kubernetes um, services and applications. Uh, the uh, Operator SDK has an Ansible plugin to it, or that it's actually part of the Operator SDK lets you write Ansible content to manage things right on the cluster itself. So I won't be able to go into a lot of depth. I usually give this that this one slide as a whole separate 30, 50 minute uh, presentation, but uh, definitely be aware of that and check that out if you're doing uh, Kubernetes work. And then the last thing I wanted to mention being that this is DevComp um, is, is a, uh, a Python library that's being used uh, we, we've developed and, and used extensively in a few different projects, and that's called Ansible Runner. And what it is, is it's a stable and consistent interface to Ansible itself. Uh, we, we've seen people try to use and wrap around what is happening in Ansible Playbook, uh, and then that's prone to breaks. Ansible Runner is a, is a solution to that you could uh, write code against and that it will remain um, stable. Um, so that your code doesn't break over time. Uh, that was never the intent of Ansible Playbook and some of the things in Ansible Core. So uh, the, you know you can use that to to to, to uh, run Ansible Core direct uh, directly or as part of another system, um, and it it just enables the potential for embedding Ansible services, Ansible functionality into other systems, uh, rather than try to manage the complexities of the Ansible Core moving around. Uh, we use this ourselves. Uh, Ansible Runner is used with execution environments uh, inside of AWX, and it's also a part of, of uh, the Ansible Operator SDK is using Ansible Runner itself. And that's just a few of the ways that we've already seen um, the, the, this particular library used. So if you're a developer, um, you might want to check this out. Um, it's, it's, it's out there on PyPy. Okay. Uh, a couple of quick yeah, sorry, questions. Sorry, Timothy, uh, yep. for the interrupt. Uh, your time yeah. is over. Could you please uh, conclude? Or, uh, yep, just, uh, I, so I was just going to do. Uh, yeah. um, this is, these are the links to uh, a whole bunch of community resources. I'll be posting the slides right after this so you can get the links from there. A lot of great resources out there. Uh, Bullhorn Matrix is like an IRC, a better version of IRC. And then there's a lot of ways that you could contribute and learn Ansible, self-paced training guides. Um, sorry, I didn't get to talk about inclusion policy and steering committee. And with that, I will end. Thank you very much, everyone, for listening. I'm going to pop over to that work adventure. Uh, look for me in one of uh, Tim A inside of one of the session rooms, and we can talk thank you. if you want. Thank you. All right, thank you.